Welcome to The Batter, a podcast about how brands and entrepreneurs rise. I'm your host, Jill Miller of Vera Creative, a boutique marketing firm in the Chicagoland area where I am also a part-time professor of an advertising course. Join me as I hang out with guests who know all about the ingredients to success and the recipes for disaster. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Batter. I'm excited today to talk with a good friend, Jeremy Kaplan. He's actually going to be interviewing me today. Jeremy and I have known each other for many years, and he has been just a great um, sounding board for me. I have bounced ideas off of him. He's an entrepreneur himself. He gives me great constructive criticism. Uh, he is a, a, a internet technology search engine marketing wizard, and he just brings a lot of fresh ideas and perspectives um, for my brand and for my business. So I'm super happy to introduce Jeremy Kaplan. Well, thanks for having me, Jill. Um, this is going to be a lot of fun to pick your brain, um, being as you're the expert in the marketing. But uh, just as a general comment, I mean, you are really one of the most driven people that I know. Um, you are able to juggle a million different things. You run your own business. You've got a family. You're teaching yoga. You know, tell us a little bit about all the different things that you do. Well, thank you. I appreciate that compliment. So, yeah, I do several different things. Um, the Let's see, we'll start in order. <laughs> in 2010, okay. I started Vera Creative, so that's my marketing firm. So I've been helping small businesses with their marketing and a lot of different things, actually. Sometimes I do like some administrative duties. Um, I just wrote a, a letter on behalf of one of my clients to her neighbor because they're having a dispute over property boundaries. So my, um, my role for my clients is constantly morphing and changing, and wherever I can help them, I help them. And so that's where I spend the majority of my time. That would be like my full-time gig, I would say, would be very creative, the marketing firm. But also around that time when I was starting Vera Creative, I was getting certified to teach Baptiste Power Vinyasa Yoga. So I ended my certification, I believe, around 2012 is when I became fully certified. Um, and I had started teaching a little bit before then. So I've been teaching yoga for several years now. And in 2014, I received an opportunity to teach an advertising course as an adjunct professor at St. Xavier University in Chicago. And so I jumped on that opportunity, and I have been doing that part-time ever since. And you're a mom somehow. I just don't know how you're able to do it all. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Gee, forgot about my family. I get yeah, so excited don't about forget my the baby. <laughs> I have a wonderful, wonderful two-year-old daughter and an okay husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound like you have much going on at all, really. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty boring. <laughs> right. So tell me about your uh, yoga teaching. So for yoga teaching, I have done a couple of Zoom classes through the studio that I teach at, and uh -huh. they recently kind of – decided not to reopen their doors, so they're strictly... Oh, no. Um, yeah, I know. It's, uh, you know, that was a business that I kind of modeled many other businesses after, and uh -huh. I would always look to um, for inspiration and for advice and just for, like, day-to-day -day operations and how they handle things, and I would really draw yeah. on them because they're very they ran their business very very well and mm -hmm. um so yeah so that it, that was hard for me on many levels uh to hear that they were closing the studio space but they're mm -hmm. really sound in their decision and they're moving more towards like a philanthropic just a ton of fundraising free classes uh they found an outdoor space where they can do it for now until it gets really cold um mm -hmm. and and then zoom and we also do audio recordings so i have a couple audio recordings that are posted on their website and then i'm mm -hmm. also in the process of posting some audio on my own website oh, not nice. my dear creative.com i'm keeping kind of the two brands separate but me as a yoga uh -huh. teacher um, I have a website where I really want to get into leading a silent retreat. 
which is basically a weekend of no talking. So you get a group of people together and you go to a really fabulous place and you Mm -hmm. just disconnect and unplug from everything. And I think it's kind of a sharp contrast to marketing because marketing is, it's in your face. It's, you know, it's constant. It's message after message after message. And then Mm -hmm. here I am and I'm like, okay, let's tune it all out. (laughs) Um, Because it's really important to to tune things out. Um, from time to time too. So, so yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's like sort of a break for you in addition to, you know, bringing along other people to kind of take a break from their lives as well. Yeah, for sure. I think that there's a lot of places in which all of the things that I do really intersect and collide. And so it's really uh-huh. unique to be able to, bring perspectives of, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a busy mom now, hey, let's go chill out. You need this break time. You need this downtime. It's so good for your mental and emotional health. Um, And I have a lot of tools that I just feel like I could share with people in a way that would really be impactful for them. And so that's my main goal behind it. It's just have a lot in my mind, in my heart that I really want to share. And Mm -hmm. I do that, like I said, through my marketing work, through my yoga work, and through teaching at the university. Wow. Um, So uh, with Vera Creative, uh, what aspects of that do you enjoy the most? Because it sounds like, you know, as a marketing consultant, you're doing so many different things because, you know, I've looked at your website and you do branding and you do, you know, email campaigns and social media and all these different things, um, you know, which, one, which of those do you enjoy the most? Let's see. From, um, from an execution standpoint, I think I enjoy branding the most. I love coming up, helping like a startup company come up with their name, ensuring that their logo really fits with the name and that it's, you know, if their target market is primarily women, making sure that the logo speaks to the majority of their target market because I feel like, that's, a, that's where a lot of people kind of get it wrong is you look at their brand and it just doesn't speak to their target market. It's not going to resonate with them, you know, and, mm-hmm. and it's little minor details down to the font. You know, the font <laughs> might just be really kind of a turn off to a female or the color might be a turn off oh, wow. to a male or, yeah. So, yeah, so I really, I, I love branding. I love kind of playing the devil's advocate with my clients and with myself and saying, well, if we did this, people might perceive it this way, but if we did that, they might perceive it that way. And, you know, here Mm -hmm. are the pros and the cons of, you know, this potential business name. And, and so, yeah, there's just, I put so much thought and so much research into it. And it's just a really exciting time in the process of starting a business. For me, it's like the the beginning (laughs) part. Yeah. Yeah. Before all the, you know, real major stressors hit, but like the colors and Mm -hmm. picking the tagline and, you know, and that's kind of like my tagline is victory for brands. And that's the other thing that I enjoy the most, I would say, is just getting like these little, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) yeah. Um, winning all the customers. No, um, right. like li- little victories, like little victories for my clients, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, just the other day, uh, my assistant has actually been helping me uh, create Snapchat lenses. Now, I don't pretend to be any sort of Snapchat expert. It's totally not. I don't fit the demographic of people who use <laughs> Yeah, right, yeah. so that's, that would be the younger, uh, like Generation yeah. Z people are more into that particular yeah. Uh, app, right? Yeah, for sure. And my client that has a CrossFit gym, they do a lot with the local high school, and they have an after-school program um, for uh, and for teens and for and then a CrossFit kids program. And Snapchat mm-hmm. has been just this awesome tool to reach the younger demographic. Um, We just came out with a lens. We posted it like a day ago, and it already had like 500 views and like 23 shares and, you know, and just in one day. And this this is a local business. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's a lot of potential customers that they're they're reaching. Yes, thank you. So that's how you would measure 
the success of a campaign then would be, you know, how many times the video was viewed and, you know, the, the interaction and stuff. Yes, and putting that into mm -hmm. perspective of like, well, there's only 12,000 people in the town. So oh, if wow. you're capturing 500 in one day, right, like Jeez. that's a big deal. So it might not sound, you know, 500 views or, you know, 20. Well, right. I mean, if that's, big if that's a lot of. This, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you work primarily with the smaller businesses and new businesses, or you work with pretty much everybody? Yeah, I try not to get too involved with MLMs, multi-level marketing. Uh -huh. um, I try not to get too involved with franchised businesses or okay. um, businesses that already have an internal marketing department. That oh right, because then you gotta you're you're sort of sharing the responsibility, and you know you probably don't have as much control over what's happening as you'd prefer. Yeah, exactly. So um, those, those have been some of my hardest projects, and it's not that I won't take them on, but in terms mm -hmm. of seeing success, I don't know, I just seem to, in the way I define success, I seem to reach it <laughs> on my own. <laughs> mm -hmm. Jill does not work well with others. <laughs> Hey, now, don't really say that. My card. <laughs> <laughs> right, all the potential clients just turned off the podcast right here. <laughs> like, never mind. Uh, yeah. No, I work well with my clients. I just <laughs> like other <laughs> with different opinions of how to right. be because I have pretty, pretty strong opinions and, and pretty mm -hmm. good instinct, and I feel like I've been doing it long enough to where, you know, I can really foresee some things that could happen and, you know, and then when they do happen, that can be frustrating or when they don't happen, right. it can be frustrating. You know, well, if they don't take so. your advice, I mean, there's not a lot you can do other than, you know, tell them 20 times and, you know, when it, when it blows up in their face or something, you know, it's right. not fun for anybody to say, I told you so, but at the same time, you know, right. hopefully you can get and some credibility with the business by doing some things that, that do work rather than warning them about things that are not going to happen or things that are going to go wrong and then they do. Right. And like, you kind of have to hope that when things do go wrong, like that the business owner or whoever I'm working with is kind of humble enough to be like, well, she did say so. <laughs> and I didn't mm -hmm. listen, you know, cause I think it's very easy to be like, Oh, well it's, you know, like I could get the blame, like it's your fault, you know, versus mm -hmm. well, there's 10 to, you know, one million things that happen after the marketing process and before the final sale that I don't have any control over. You know, say mm -hmm. it's a, say it's an online purchase. Well, I'm, you know, I'm not in control of tracking, shipping, mm -hmm. you know, like that type of thing. Customer, Customer service. service return, right. Yeah, return policies. Like I could help set clients up with that and be like, hey, the, the research shows that people are expecting free returns you know, or like mm -hmm. a, an ample amount of, you know, a generous return policy. Like that's a thing. Research actually does show <laughs> that. So I can, I can teach my client that, but then if they don't, you know, take me up on it, like I said, mm -hmm. there's just so much that's out of my control. So, you know, it's nice to work with people who are like level headed and have realistic expectations and are humble enough to be like, well, if I'm not going to listen to her advice, I, I may find mm -hmm. out the hard way something <laughs> right and you obviously want people open to your ideas and you're a very creative person and you know even though they are hands-on in their own business and probably know the ins and outs of it more than you coming in from the outside you know they still need to sort of take a step back and you know be open to suggestions rather than uh, you know giving you marching orders that maybe are things you know aren't really effective and, you know, forcing you to put yourself in a position where, you know, you're not going to help them as much as you could. Right. Like a hundred percent. Like if you're going to hire me, kind of let me do my thing. Don't mm -hmm. try and force me into your box of what you think is going to work right. and then blame me when it doesn't. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So what are some of the mistakes that you've seen people make with social media? So with social media in particular, I feel like some of the biggest mistakes are 
inconsistency with posting. So they're not posting mm-hmm. enough. You know, you might go to somebody's page and the last time they posted was 2017 or even three weeks ago or just one week ago. Like those are, that's all too long in between mm-hmm. posts. So inconsistency with posting. Another one is just, you know, like I think I might have mentioned this in a previous podcast or I just said it to somebody because that's why it's in my brain. But like when Twitter <laughs> originally came out, um, they – Twitter had a character limit for a reason. And it's, again, mm-hmm. I say this all the time, people do not read. So when you see a lot of text or when people even perceive something to take them a long time to read, they won't read it. Mm-hmm. Even if it truly doesn't take them that long, if it just looks like it's going to take up their time, they ignore mm-hmm. it. So a lot of times I think people are too wordy, too verbose um, in their comment, not the comments, but in like the actual text you know, of the ad things. copy, yeah, that, even yeah. in m- any kind of campaign, probably because you know, again, attention spans are short, and yeah. you know, people are are used to so much information so quickly that you know they don't have as much patience as it seems like they did in the past. Right, you can definitely tell um, businesses who haven't figured out where to source images, like high quality images from, and so. Mm-hmm. I feel like it can be a mistake. Um, either people are using images off of Google, which could subject you to copyright infringement, um, oh, right. or the images are real blurry um, for, mm-hmm. for whatever reason. So I, I, that's kind of a mistake. And then with um, this doesn't happen a lot. I, I think a lot of businesses are, are starting to kind of get it and use some of the really like user-friendly design programs out there to create content. But um, Mm -hmm. I'm still seeing it a little bit where if somebody's trying to share something from Facebook to Instagram, the size requirements are different. And so if you're just going to post it to Facebook and like automatically have it go to Instagram or the other way around, like you can go to Instagram, not so much Instagram to Facebook, but Facebook to Instagram you, the, your mm-hmm. your content gets cut off, your image gets cut off on Instagram because it's a narrower picture, if that makes sense, versus yeah. Facebook, which is like a wider photo. Yeah, it's just the right. And I mean, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure it's easy for a company that's not putting a whole lot of effort into their social media yeah. to just kind of make a post and then think that they can just put the same exact thing in all their different platforms. Um, yes. Yeah you know, exactly the same way. But I guess if you dig into the technical aspects of it, you know, that's something I wouldn't have realized until you mentioned it. You know, they're the same company. You would think that things would, would uh, interact better. Right. But that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and usually when somebody's using one platform and then just blasting it to all platforms, they're not even going to those other platforms to make sure that it shows up. Because that's the mm. point, right? They're trying to just get it done and get it out there. Um, and, right. and so that's what I think social media, like any other marketing, it, it's got to have, you got to have an objective and a goal. And if your objective is, you know, your objective has to be a little loose with social media. If you're mm. expecting a huge return on your investment, you're probably not going to get it. It's just not there these days. Um, okay. So is that more of a long-term investment with social media to just kind of help your brand? I think it's a long-term investment, but I also think it's more of an awareness tool versus a conversion tool. And that's not true for all industries or all brands, but um, definitely for my clients, we use it more for just awareness, just a way to stay in people's faces, to stay top of mind, to maybe some, maybe a little bit of education but again, you, you, right. you don't want to be too wordy in your in your <laughs> in your copy, and yeah, when you're trying to explain something, that can get wordy. So, yeah. So then, something that you know business owners also use in a lot of cases would be uh, email marketing campaigns, and those are probably something where you can measure the return on an easier way and sort of determine whether the campaign is effective by, you know, the instant sales results. Um, so tell us about email campaigns and what are some of the mistakes people make with those and, and you know, uh, do they just all end up in spam folders and are a waste of time or is it something that, you know, some businesses are able to convert a lot with? 
Yeah, so definitely I want to encourage businesses, again, who are using email marketing just like any other marketing tactic is, you know, to to have a goal for each campaign and to have strategy and research. You know, do your research. Figure out, you know, read general research about when it's best for your industry, but then if it's not working, don't be afraid to change it up. Look at Mm -hmm. your email open rates. Look at what time most people open the email. If it's not till later Mm -hmm. at night, then start sending them later at night. You got to meet people where they're at. So that's kind of the first thing is, is don't just execute marketing strategy, like marketing willy nilly. I'm just going to throw this post up there. I don't really care what it says. I'm just doing it because I know that it's good for me to be on social media, right? Like, no, (laughs) you know, have a purpose, Um, you know, hold, hold, hold yourself to a little higher standard, I guess, in terms of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, especially because it, it's got to be relevant. If it's not relevant, it's just going to blow. People are just going to blow right past it. Right. So yeah. I mean, to, you get so many yeah. emails these days, and you're just mm-hmm. kind of the subject better catch your eye. Otherwise, you're not even going to open the email itself. Yeah, I have a huge lecture that I do for my students. Um, it's kind of twofold. We go over the pros and cons of almost every kind of traditional form of media in what they call new form of media, even though, you know, the Internet is not really new to us anymore. But <laughs> gosh, when, when I was in school, right. that was considered new media. But um, we go over the pros and cons, and then we also could dive deep into just statistics as to who's using them and what the um, return on investment is and the psychographics, mm-hmm. what people are thinking and their attitudes and their belief towards those types of marketing tactics. And one of the most recent uh, statistics that I came across for email marketing is that the average lifespan of an email is 17 seconds. So I imagine Whoa. what that means. Yeah, right? So I when you say lifespan, that. when you say lifespan, that means, you know, from the moment somebody looks at the subject or is that from the moment they, they open it and how long they spend looking at it? Correct, and I think even sometimes from the moment that like they open it and then it gets deleted. So, so yeah. Oh wow. Exactly. So you better now, make your you, point quickly. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so now, if you look at direct a direct mail piece, so something you get in the mailbox, um, uh-huh. that have, has an average lifespan of 17 days. Hmm. So that's oh, when it's laying yeah. around on the kitchen table, and you know. Mm-hmm. Gets, you know, sift yeah. it through in a drawer somewhere six months later. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when you actually I need get it. the air, con- air conditioner guy to come out and fix your air conditioner. Yeah, you got that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you got that coupon or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. right. You remember it because you're like, oh yeah, I remember looking through the mailbox when I was getting my bill for such and such, and you know, I also saw this other, uh, you know, piece of mail that stuck in my brain for whatever reason because it had all the right colors and <laughs> all the rest and of it. It's tangible. You can hold it and something you can uh-huh. look at and hold and feel, it, it, you create a, just a much more even physical connection with it than you do with an email. And you mm-hmm. might get five pieces of, of mail a day but 50 emails a day. Or oh, you know, right. And, yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, so email marketing is, is interesting. I think the hardest thing to do is to grow your list organically. You know, okay. I think I was just explaining to one of my clients, um, I obviously integration too is a huge key. I wanted to say that back with social media, when you're posting to social media that um, I just told somebody the other day, I'm like, hey, you know, I can't see your links to your social media on your website. They're kind of hidden behind like another block of of text oh. and that still isn't fixed, you know, and like, okay. so when you say integration, like, oh. you mean connecting all of the different, you know, aspects of the business. Right, exactly. Fill out your profile so that it leads to your website and then make sure you're linking to all your social channels from your website. Um, and the okay. same with your newsletters, you want to have a place where people can sign up for your newsletter on your website. Okay. However, if for a lot of, because that's the, okay, when they opt in, that's obviously legally, <laughs> they have to uh-huh. opt in for you to be able to send them your, your email. And okay. 
it's just, it's just a really hard thing to do to get people to give you their email address again, because we are right. bombarded with so many emails. So I mm-hmm. feel like the, the reason people are going to do it is because, you know, they truly are interested in what you are selling or your, mm-hmm. your business, or there's like, you're giving them some sort of discount. There's an exchange. Okay. So the benefit for signing up. Yeah. Yeah. Got yep. it. Exactly. So, yeah. All right. So you mentioned websites. Mm-hmm. So that's obviously a key thing too. Uh, what are some of the mistakes people make um, when they build their websites? Yeah. Again, lack of integration, just lack of, you know, um, I can't get to the social media page or when, oh my gosh, when the link is broken. <laughs> oh, yeah. So many people. Right. Yeah, that comes off really <laughs> unprofessional. Yeah. You, know, yeah you, that's, you go to a website and there's stuff that's not working or broken links. You're like, yeah, well, these yeah. guys don't know what they're doing. I'm not going to use their company. Right. Or you built your website in 2000 and you haven't rebuilt it since. <laughs> it's like, uh-huh. it's, because website design changes. People can tell just from the design of modern versus an outdated website. And that sends a message to people. And so, you know, be, being up to date in terms of your layout, your design, your content, I think is important. And then mm-hmm. it's kind of a personal gripe, but I have seen statistics that, that other people feel this way as well, is that like a lighter background with darker text is easier to read than a dark background with white text. So like black, mm-hmm. uh, white text on a black background is this a really sharp contrast. It can look kind of blurry even when it's mm-hmm. not. Um, so I see a lot of brands that kind of, I don't know. That, they don't that, go for that dark it, mode then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so I would say like lack of integration, poor design, and just not being mm-hmm. up to date. Um, I personally hate when all I can do is fill out a contact form when there's no right. It's just not even a website. It's just like a form. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it's like the only way you can contact. And like nine times out of ten, I never get a response from that form. But I know, like, huh. if I called that person, then I would probably get a better or faster response. So right. you know. I have, like, when on my clients' websites, we have a form, but we also have direct mm-hmm. contact, direct emails um, that get directly to the business owner. And one mm-hmm. of my clients, I'm, I have her email on my phone, so I see everything coming in and help her mm-hmm. a little bit with that, and the same with the contact form. You know, if don't link it to an email. You don't check that often or that, yeah. you know, your low-level employee <laughs> checks, you know. Link it somewhere mm-hmm. important because those people are waiting for a response, and in that wait time, if you're not responding, they're moving on to somebody else. That's true, right. If they're reaching out to you, you know, they want something, you're right. Um, and then obviously, too, um, now that things have evolved and there's so many mobile devices, I think that's probably a common mistake, too, is that, you know, people have a one, one website that works the same way for maybe it looks better on a desktop computer yeah. and maybe not so well on a, on a mobile device. Yeah, and, you know, most modern websites will just kind of, they're responsive, and so they'll automatically size up pretty good on a mobile device. But I have, mm-hmm. seems like the smaller the business, kind of the, the more challenge, challenges they have with a good website, with getting mm-hmm. it well, yeah, it's expensive. I mean, that's, updated, yeah. Right, that's a big investment for a company, and, you know, you were talking about businesses just starting out. I mean, if you're a business just starting out, you sort of have to decide where you want to put your resources. You know, do you want to make a huge investment right at the beginning on your website or do you want to, you know, work on your infrastructure and, you know, hire staff members or, you know, try to do other things? So how do you help an entrepreneur decide, you know, where they want to invest their resources, especially at the beginning when they're sort of just figuring out what works and what doesn't? It definitely comes back around to their target market and mm-hmm. where, where are their, what's their target market expecting. You've got to deliver what people are expecting. Um, yeah. And so for me, I'm of the generation where when I see, you know, maybe I see like something really cool on Instagram and I want to check out the website, but all that does is lead me to a Facebook page. 
or right. so you just you, go in a big know, circle. Like, or Google, you Google somebody and, you know, you hit the, the website button and it goes to a social media page instead of a website. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know, it just, especially when it's Facebook, I just get so bothered because Facebook doesn't give me the information that I want. And it's not, mm-hmm. you have to dig for it, right? Like, mm-hmm. you, ha- you know, to go to the about section or the pricing or to find, you know, real good information on what it is you're looking at. Facebook just, it's not laid out. It's not it's not there in a way that people would expect, you know, the information to be. On the right. Website. But it's also free so, for a business to just make a Facebook yeah. page and say, all right, well, here's our website for right now. It's just our Facebook right. page. Right. And if you're targeted so. a heavy, heavy user of Facebook, then maybe that makes sense. And if you know mm-hmm. how to convert people from Facebook and you've got it all set up so that your sales channel kind of leads people through you know, the sales pipeline and rights and you can convert. Great. Um, But yeah, just in terms of where to spend your money, I I really do think that websites legitimize a business. I think, you Mm -hmm. know, they're just, again, it's kind of expected that you have a website Mm -hmm. and when you don't have one, it's like, uh, are they not, are they not serious? And they not as, are they not as big? Like, what if something goes mm-hmm. wrong? How do I contact them? They don't have a website. Like, are they really going to mm-hmm. answer this Facebook message? Like, you know, right. this type of thing. So, so that's kind of, but, but again, there's, there's times when maybe you could get away without having a website. And then I would say maybe down the road, it's still important. Right. But up front, yeah, we could probably get away with just a, you know, an Instagram page right now because Instagram does, you know, the link tree that everybody is using up in the bio. Um, that allows you to link to multiple places, uh, which is and really And that's new, cool. right? They didn't have that before. That's I don't a remember. A little newer, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I just recently integrated it into my own Instagram account and all of my clients' accounts. And it's great because we can say link in bio without having to change the link in the bio every single time mm-hmm. you're talking about the link in the bio. <laughs> Um, right. That's a, that's, a, that's a great tool. And people can shop right off of Instagram without leaving Instagram. So if you're selling something mm-hmm. online, then it's, it's good for that as well. So there are instances, but again, it just comes down to your target market. And usually, usually it's a demographic thing. It's an it's a age, right. age, <laughs> age thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, again, depending on who your customers are, you know, you want to figure out what they're doing and where you can reach them. So that's probably an, an interesting uh, problem that you have to approach and, and understand, you know, people who like this product, you know, also have a certain activity that they do that's not related directly to your business or whatever, which you can reach those people through. So that sounds like an interesting, uh, fun thing to try to solve. Well, yeah, I do. I love kind of the psychology behind things. Not that I fully understand it, um, or will ever mm-hmm. understand what why people do things. <laughs> they do. Oh yeah, that, we could talk for hours about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> why do people do what they do? <laughs> um, but yeah, like kind of going back to to what you were saying before, when I work with a client. What, yes, they know their business best, but a lot of times it's great to have that external voice come in because they're so close to the business, they can't, like, see its flaws, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's good to have that external voice come in and say, well, you know, that, that, that's great information that you've already accumulated or that's great knowledge. Now let's also consider the outsider's perspective, which I am for the most part an outsider's perspective until, you know, and I work with some of my businesses I've been working for six, seven, eight years now. So it's, wow. it gets hard to stay an outsider. But um, yeah, uh-huh. so, so anyways, uh, it can be good to have that outside perspective and that updated research because the research is always changing again, mm-hmm. um, you know. So, so yeah, so I think kind of a combination of what is the research saying, who is your target market, what do you know to be true about your business? And then me as the marketing professional, what have I seen to be true? What have I seen work best? And, you know, what are kind of the best practices and industry standards? And let's 
take all of that information, create a strong objective and goal for this marketing campaign, and then figure out the strategy and the creativity behind it. Right, and that seems to be where you, you know, have an advantage over other people just from knowing you for so long. You know, you, you have a really creative mind and, you know, you'll think outside the box and, you know, you'll come up with some interesting ideas that, that people may not have considered at all. I have like ideas in my head where I'm just kind of waiting for the right client to come along. Like you said, they might not be right for one client, but I just, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this would be so awesome. This would work so well. I just, you know, but it's just, it's really geared toward this industry and not anybody that would okay. come in, not in any of the industries that my clients are in. So yeah, like I'm constantly mm -hmm. brainstorming and, and thinking and jotting ideas down and kind of putting things in my tool belt and saving them for later. Um, yeah and reinventing the wheel, and, and then it's a lot of fun. Like in my job, no two days are the same. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so tell me more, you know, uh, you're obviously a more uh, hands-on, smaller company, and there's, you know, a lot larger marketing firms to work with versus Vera Creative. So why would someone want to hire you versus, you know, a larger, more established, I mean, you've been around for 10 years, so it's not like you're a uh, fly-by-night right. operation, but at the same time, <laughs> like, what's the advantage of, of hiring you? Yeah, I think, like, going back to customer service, it's funny because people will be like, why do you even set your out of office? Like, you, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, never, you're never really out of the office, you know, and I've mentioned mm -hmm. this in another podcast, like, I've been texting clients from the hospital bed. I've been, you know, my... My, it partially stems from my desire to want to be liked and accepted, but mostly mm -hmm. because, like, I truly love my job. I truly care about my clients and because I get it. If they're communicating with me, it's because they have the time to do it. And if I mm -hmm. wait and make them wait for a response or, you know, it's like it, it just makes my job harder, right? Yeah. Um, so I Yeah, you do seem to be – working 24 seven. I, I don't know how you're able to juggle all these different things. It's amazing to me. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I think mm -hmm. because all of the things that I do, I'm so passionate about and I love to do that. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel like work. It's like, I'm lucky I get to do this. I get to share this and it's challenging and the challenge is motivating. Um, and when you get results, then you're motivated to do even better for the client. And mm -hmm. yeah, just you know, I really want people to be to be successful. So there's yeah. kind of that. Yeah. So then um, you offer, you know, you, which I guess is the advantage over a larger firm who probably handles a lot more clients and won't give that response at 2 o'clock right. in the morning when something breaks or uh, from the hospital bed. <laughs> <laughs> right, like you're not, you're not going to get a receptionist, right, when you call my office. <laughs> you're not going to mm -hmm. get, like you get me directly, the person who's in charge. You're not going to have yeah. to wait until the, you know, the marketing intern gets around to figuring out what went wrong or, you know, change something or um, anything like that. Um, and I think and it, this is probably true for all um, outsourced uh, help, but I always like to remind my clients that I'm tax, like I'm a tax write-off. <laughs> so I'm basically a full-time employee that they can mm -hmm. contact day or night that will work very hard for them, but they don't have to pay employment tax or unemployment tax. <laughs> or right, you're an independent like contractor, that. so yeah. you know, you're, they're still spending money that, that's the uh, – a business expense on you to uh, help them, you know, help help For their sure. business. For sure. Um, yep. So I don't know what else. Um, do you think people should know about Vera Creative? Um, you know, obviously, when you talk to a prospective new client, it's sort of like a job interview then for you, right? You're going in there every single time with a new business and you know, they're deciding whether or not to hire you. And um, is that stressful for you when you talk to new clients all the time? No. And I try, like, this is like total, like, inside scoop here. It's like, I feel like if I let them interview me, then I'm losing my power. Like, I mm -hmm. need to be in charge of the interview. And mm -hmm. it's actually, 
I'm scoping them out and I'm kind of interviewing them. Like what's your budget and what's your timeline for, you know, your expectations on results? Because I've had people that are (laughs) one of the crazy expectations. Yeah. It's like, you know, your website's a hot mess. You haven't updated your social media. You've told me 18 things you want to implement and you want results in three months. Bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, right, right. So you probably don't take on a lot of potential clients just because you, you can see from the outside, you know, hey, do I want to invest my time into this company where, you know, they need a whole lot more than I can even give them to be successful and, you know, or they're not going to listen to my ideas or, you know, there's probably a lot of other reasons where you wouldn't want to take on a, a new client. So how do you handle that situation? How does that work? So, yeah, so I guess it's kind of, it just depends on the situation. So it yeah. might be where um, I would say, you know, right now I don't think this is something I can help you with or, you know, if they're mm-hmm. not willing to put forth. Because I, I can't make miracles happen when your website is, you know, really outdated but you're not willing to update it, and that's where mm-hmm. I need to drive traffic to. All my efforts mm-hmm. from our social media to, to then get people to go to your website to book a service or whatever it is, if, you're, if that mm-hmm. process is clunky and you're not willing to change it, we're not yeah. going to get results. And again, going back to making my job harder, I'm not going to mm-hmm. be able to achieve what you, you are expecting. So I might yeah. say something like, you know, maybe you can find someone else to, to help you improve your website if you're not willing to pay what I'm, you know, quoting you. And then mm-hmm. we can look at things down the road and kind of revisit. So it's just a conversation yeah. where I try to help them as much as I can, but at the end of the day, if they're not going to listen, they're not going to listen, you know, and right. you just, it's business. You can't take it personally. You just kind of have to move on, and it's truly uh, it's them, not you. <laughs> yeah. Kind of. So tell me about your perfect client. Describe them. Yeah, so I feel like right now I'm working with um, several clients that are, are pretty perfect, but ideally uh, a business owner comes to me before a lot of the decisions have been made. Um, So they come to me before they have the logo or before they have the business name or before they have the website. Um, That way I can be involved from the beginning and we can make sure that we use the research right out of the gate and that we implement good strategy right away. That's not to say I can't work with a five, six, seven, you know, 15-year-old business. I, I certainly can. I do feel like um, when I get to work with somebody from the beginning, we uh, both, the client and I, build a lot more trust within each other um, just because I've been with them from the beginning and they can kind of see the whole entire process. When somebody comes to me kind of after the fact, after money has been wasted, they're a little bit more hesitant to to take my word for it and spend even more money, or after they've been kind of burned in some way, maybe they worked with another consultant who wasn't, um, you know, didn't get them results. So so there's a lot of different uh, barriers, I guess, that can come up down the road. So ideally, mm-hmm. I, love, I love just getting in on the ground floor, the beginning stages of a business. But again, that said, um, you know, I feel like I can, I have the ability, I have the research, I have the understanding, I have the knowledge, I have the experience to where I can just jump in and say, all right, you know, this is what we need to change. And it can be hard at times, especially Mm -hmm. the longer you've owned your business, to hear somebody say, well, I want you to do it completely differently. Um, But like I said, as long as that trust is there um, and they give me the opportunity to to really show them where I'm going with it, then it works out really well. Well, that's great. Yeah. So we're going to wrap things up for today. I think we should definitely do this again. But, Jeremy, I just want to thank you for your time and thank you for the offer. I know when I first told you that I was um, going to do a podcast, one of the first things out of your mouth was that you should interview me. And I kind of laughed. But here we are. We got it done. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, you're welcome. This has been a lot of fun. 
Thanks, Jeremy. All right, listeners, I want to remind you that every week we do a coffee contest giveaway. All you have to do is share the podcast. Take a screenshot of it or use the social share options on the podcast app that you listen on and tag at Vera Creative on Instagram or on Facebook, and you are automatically entered to win a Starbucks gift card. I'll just uh, send it to your email. So please uh, enter, and thanks again for listening, everybody.